Jackson Advanced Mathematics, lesson 55. Are you ready for a fun lesson? I am. We're gonna talk about permutations, and I'm calling this lesson Fancy Permutations because they're a little different than what we have been doing. Some people get frustrated with these problems because there really isn't a set formula or a specific process to work exactly the same every time you have to logic out each problem in and of itself, but if you enjoy kind of the creative part of that, these are really fun. Um, P.S. I'm just going to say this. Don't watch my videos on accelerated speed, right? Don't watch them at one and a half. Don't watch them at two. This is hard enough to learn at slow speed. If you want to do anything, put me on slow motion. I don't think there's a setting for that, but please don't speed up these videos. It is not going to be your friend to try and do that. I had one student that was so lost and so confused and I couldn't understand it because he was a really smart young man, but he could not wrap his head around even some of the simplest things. And it really was disturbing to me because I couldn't figure out what was wrong. Then finally he told me he was watching the videos on an accelerated speed. And I was like, dude, please don't do that. So you know what happened? He slowed down and went back to regular. And it took a while because we had to piece things back together. But that was the problem. Once we got him back on normal speed and filled in all the old holes, it was good. So anyway, that's my uh, PSA for today. Don't speed me up. Okay, let's say that we've got a king and a queen and a prince. And they have a, they have a couple different feasting tables. And their first feasting table is shaped like this. It's the kind of banquet table where, you know, the king and the queen and the prince, they sit up in front and all the peasants sit out here, right? It's the kind you see on TV all the time. So when we want to figure out the number of ways they can sit up here, that would be considered a linear permutation. Okay, obviously they can't be replaced. So, because they're physical beings. So whoever sits down first, there's this first chair, there's three options for that, and then two, and then one. So we know that there are six ways they can sit at that table. But they also have a round table. And that requires a different kind of thinking. So here, here's their table, and I'm gonna draw their chairs so we have a place to write our numbers. Here they are at their circular feasting table. And this is a little bit different because the queen can sit here. Um, let me see, what's the easiest way to explain this? King, queen, prince, king, queen, prince, king, queen, prince. They can just move around the table. They can even just scoot their chairs, right? And they're still sitting in the same order, just in different chairs. That's not any different, all right? So the way we calculate the permutations is different when things are arranged in a circle. And the easiest way I can explain this is to say the first person must sit down. Once one person sits down, then we can start arranging ourselves in different ways. So I pick any chair. I say, this is the first chair. Somebody just has to sit down here. So I put a one in that box. Now, who can sit in this seat? Any one of the other people. And then the last person sits there. So when we have a circular permutation, when the king and the queen and the prince sit at the circular table, there are only two ways that they can sit, right? One times two times one. So what we see is that when there's a line and there's a beginning and an end, there are more ways you can arrange them. But once you put people in a circle, there are much fewer, there are fewer ways because 
just changing seats in, in the same order is not gonna produce a different permutation, all right? So that is the trick of circular permutation. The first person sits down, so we put a one in the first box and then count down from there. Let's do a problem. Example 55.1. How many ways can six different items be arranged in a line, and how many ways can six different items be arranged in a circle? Okay, so we're doing this again. If we do them in a line, six different things being arranged in a line. So there's my line. Well, they're physical objects, so there's no replacement. We have that scenario, don't we? We can write that as six factorial. We can calculate it on a calculator. We can also do it by hand. And it's 30 times 12 is 360 times two is 720. I just did it in my head. So either one of those ways is fine. If you wanna practice using the factorial key, I'm okay with that, but double check your answer with a mental calculation. What if they're sitting in a circle? Now, I'm not gonna draw a circle every time because that's just messy on my paper and harder to draw. So I'm gonna draw this as a circular permutation. Okay, so this is the linear. And this one is the circle. And let me draw my boxes. You're drawing two. Okay, I'll give you a second to catch up. I know I go too fast a lot of the times. All right, so our circular permutation, we recognize that it's a circle even though we're drawing boxes, and we remember the first person just has to sit down. Somebody just has to lay the first object down in that circle. Then we have options, right? Notice that when we write this as a factorial, it's one less than the number of items, right? Here the factorial is equal to the number of items, but in a circular permutation, it's one less. And so this would be, let's do this in our heads, 20 times six, that would be 120. Wow, that's a lot fewer, isn't it? When we arrange things in a circle instead of a line, there are 600 fewer permutations, 600 different ways to arrange. Huh, interesting. I mean, kind of, right? Okay, let's do the next one and then we'll go on to a different situation. 55.2, ready? It's gonna be exciting. When the chips were down, Ed found that there were five chips and each one was a different color. What, John? I think John had a late lunch that day and his blood sugar was low and he wrote this one when he should have been eating his sandwich. He was a little crazy. When the chips were down, Ed found that there were five chips and each one was a different color. How many ways could Ed place them, A, in a row or B, in a circle? That is a crazy way of saying, take five objects and calculate the linear permutation and the circular permutation. It's much spicier the way John said it, but that's fine. Okay, so this is our linear. I'll put an L for linear. One, two, three, four, five. Um, they're physical chips, so there's no replacement. Five, four, three, two, one. That is equal to five factorial, right? And that equals, we just calculated this, it's 120. What if they're in a circle? Again, we draw the box, even though we're arranging them in a circle, and we remember that the underlying difference with a circular permutation is that someone just has to go first. We just have to lay the first object down, one. Now we do the rest like so. It's four factorial, just like I said, right? It'll be one less than the number of objects. Um, four times three is 12, times two, it's only 24. Wow, big difference, right? So there is a quickie little study 
of circular permutations and how they work differently. The first one just has to be laid down. Our next special topic, and I think this is the only one, yes, are called distinguishable permutations. That's a mouthful, right? It also looks like alph alphabet soup when you spell it. It's like anti-disestablishmentarianism. Okay, distinguishable permutations come about in a situation like this. Let's say that we're taking the letters to the word cat and we want to know how many ways we could arrange them. And we're saying there's no replacement, all right? So for the letters in the word cat, we have three, two, one, six different ways, right? What if we take the word moo? Well, that should be the same, right? Because there are three letters, not replacement, we're assuming. Um, three, two, one, that gives us six ways also. The problem is that two of the elements of this second set of permutations look the same. So let's look a little closer. Let's see what they would actually look like. And in order to help us, we're gonna give these little subscripts. This will be O1 and O2. All right, so let's just go through and list out the six different ways. So the first one is the way we wrote it. Okay, what I'm making here, just so you know, we calculated that there were six ways to arrange the letters in the word moo. So I'm writing them out. I'm writing out the six different ways. I'm just that determined, okay? So if we started with the M first and then we flipped around the two O's and we can see right away there's no difference in those other than just the subscripts. That's not a distinguishable permutation. Oh, spoilers, I let you know what's happening. Okay, let's try putting O1 first in the next two. And we can do M, O2, or we can do O2, M, right? Okay, well, those are different. Now let's try putting O2 first. And we can put the M and then the O1, and then we can put the O1 and the M. Do you see how when I put the subscripts on here, yeah, these are all different, right? Uh, because the ones and the twos are in a different order. But if I ignore the little subscripts, let me use a different color. No, I don't want to. If I ignore the little subscripts, These two permutations, these two ways of combining them are the same. And these two are the same. And these two are the same. So we can combine the letters to the word moo in six ways, but we only have three distinguishable ways. Three ways that actually look different, right? We don't want to put subscripts on our letters. So we have to find some way to take account for the fact that sometimes if we're repeating matching elements, we don't have as many ways as we think. So how are we going to do that? Ready? I'm gonna tell you. Are you pumped? What if I just left you hanging there? What if I said, okay, bye, and just left you? You would be, you know what you would be? You'd be on the edge of your seat until you got the answer to that. So, the number of, I gotta write it out again, and you do too. the number of distinguishable permutations equals this. I'm going to explain what this means. Simple little formula, right? N factorial over A factorial 
And in this case, n equals the number of items and a equals the number of any one kind. I'll show you how this works in an example and it'll make a lot more sense. All right, so in our moo example, we had three items and we had two that were the same, right? We had two O's, so we had two of one kind. So to simplify this, it helps to write it out. That cancels and we find out that the number of distinguishable permutations for mu equals three, I'm not gonna write distinguishable one more time because I'll lose my mind, three different ways. Right, there's the three. So, six permutations, but three distinguishable permutations. Oh, that's kind of fun, right? So let's try another one. This one's kind of long, so I'm gonna go to another page. You know I hate to run out of space on the page. That makes me crazy. Um, example 55.3, and I'm gonna write this up here. I'm gonna write number of distinguishable permutations. My goal is to get through the rest of this lesson without writing that word again equals n factorial over a factorial. This is the number of items. This is the ones that repeat, right? Like we put two here for the two O's. Here's our story, 55.3. There are two more after this one, by the way. Jojo has 10 marbles. Oh my gosh. Kyle, it's your sister. Spells just like her too. Jojo has 10 marbles. Three are red. Three are blue, four are green. Whoa, this is more complicated than our little moo problem, isn't it? Because there we only had one item that repeated. So we've got a new challenge in this, right? So what we're gonna do is adjust our formula ever so slightly to take into account the fact that we have more than one element repeating. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna call the red marbles A and the blue marbles will be B and the green marbles will be C. You can do whatever you want, but this works nicely because we still start with the number of items and then we divide by the factorial of each of the items that repeats, okay? So we can have multiple repeating items. We'll just put that down below. Okay, so we set our formula up using this. So it's 10 factorial because we have 10 marbles all together and then we divide it by three factorial, three factorial and four factorial. That will reduce the number of ways by taking into consideration the fact that combining them isn't gonna make any difference. All right, now we simplify this. Yes, you can use a calculator, but I also want you to feel comfortable doing this by hand. So 10 times nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two. We don't need to put one because one times anything is the same. Down below, three times two times three times two times four times three times two. I'm leaving out the ones, but I'm writing out each of those factorials. Now, let's cancel, shall we? Um, and I'm going down the list and seeing what if I can make those numbers. Three times three is nine. Two times two times two is eight. Uh, and then I can get rid of the four 
and the 3. Right? So that leaves this clump of numbers and this one. So let's do that. Let's see. This would be this would be 42 times 10. Oh, yes, and the, that 10, I forgot that. Okay, so here's 10, this one, times, let's do this, 42, and then these two go together to make another 10, right? So I cancel strategically, and then I circle up whatever's left, and I bundle that into easy answers. So that means with these 10 marbles, I can combine them into different sets of 10, but I'm gonna arrange them, right, in a line. That's what we're doing here, is we're arranging these 10 marbles in a line, recognizing the fact that any of the red marbles are gonna look the same, any of the blues will look the same, any of the greens will look the same. So there aren't gonna be as many combinations as if every marble was a completely different color, right? So what I find is that there are 4,200, I'm not gonna write distinguishable, I'm gonna write different, or you could write unique, that's another word that is useful. Right, that's the answer to this one. And let me flip, two more. I'm in the squeaky chair again today. 55.4, how many distinguishable permutations can be formed from the letters in the word nonsense? N-O-N-S-E-N-S-E. -N -S -E. We've got some repeats there, don't we? So we remember that the number of distinguishable permutations equals the total number of elements factorial divided by, and we expanded this, didn't we? so that if there's more than one element being repeated, we can take that into consideration. I see that we have one, two, three n's. I'm just gonna cross them off so I know I've taken them into consideration. We have two s's. And we have two e's. Right? Okay. So here we go, n factorial, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, over three factorial times two factorial times two factorial. And I will just tell you, no, let's do it. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, over, 3 times 2 times 2 times 2, right? We can leave off the ones. Um, let's do this. Let's take these three twos and kill the 8, and then that 3 will go against that 3. Here we have a 10, and then we have those three left. So let's see. Seven times six is 42 times 10 times four, right? So I'm gonna do 42 times 40. I'll put those two together. 1,680 unique, I'll use that word this time unique ways to combine those letters in groups of seven that will actually look completely different. That's still a lot of ways, isn't it? That's correct. Okay, one more and then we're done. I'm gonna squeeze it in down here. How many distinguishable seven digit numbers can be formed from the digits in, here they come, ready? Two, seven, just 
make sure I copied right. Yes. Uh, I want to point something out to you. In all of these problems, the number of elements we were given was the number of elements we were grouping the objects in. We're not asking like how many four digit numbers can you make out of this. That would add a new level of difficulty. So in all of these problems, the number of items we're given is the same number that we're grouping them in, right? We weren't making three letter words out of this. We were making, what is this, eight letters. So that is a simplifying factor that John's using for us that is really nice. You don't have to worry about that little trick of making it difficult. Okay, so let's see what we've got here. We've got four twos. And we've got two fours. So that will be our A and our B. Our N equals seven. So we have seven factorial over four factorial times two factorial. And I'll just tell you right now that that equals 105. Different ways unique ways, distinguishable ways, different ways. Okay, so there you have it. Two different fancy kinds of permutations that we can use when we're repeating the same elements. There, that's all. Goodbye.